Hey Rebels, my name is Matthew Barton and I'm the host of the Rebellion Brewing Podcast. Today's guest is Edward Willett. He's a prolific author of science fiction, fantasy, and non-fiction books, and the current writer-in-residence for the Saskatoon Public Library, as well as the host of an award-winning World Shapers podcast. When I told one of my friends who works in the literary world that Ed was coming on the show, he said, man, that guy writes fast. He puts out a lot of books. So I picked up some copies of World Shaper and Master of the World, two of Ed's first two novels in his World Shaper series, with a third, The Moonlit World, due out later this year. So let's get into it. Ed, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. How's it going? Great. I mean, it's feels like minus 37 they say but yeah well you know it's saskatchewan in january we if we're not used to it by now well, <laughs> at my age <laughs> i'll never get used to it <laughs> <laughs> so how's it been going good uh, i'm keeping really busy with the, the writing and the writer in residence means driving up to saskatoon every week and back which is uh last week i actually stayed over one extra night because that's when that storm blew through um, yeah, it's, that's wearing on me a bit, but I'm enjoying the work up there, and I'm in, enjoying all the writing projects I'm working on. For the uninitiated, what is a writer-in-residence? What do they do? Uh, this is something that's uh, been going on for a long time in Saskatoon, and Regina has one as well. Um, I think I'm the 39th or something up there. Basically, people can come into the library and talk to me about their writing projects. Uh, I'll look it up to 3,000 words at a time, which they send to me ahead of time, and I will mark it up and you know, <clears throat> comment on it. They'll come in and we'll talk about it. Um, I think I just had to do my midterm report. I had seen 37 individuals, I think, in the first four months of the nine-month term. Um, so and it, they run the gamut from play writers to poets to I do see a lot of science fiction and fantasy writers because of who I am um, but not necessarily and I'm working my way through uh, entire manuscripts with some of them entire novels so it's just a great free service for anybody who's looking for writing advice or help that's if somebody they aren't necessarily published yet or they are published it can be either um, most of the people I'm working with are probably largely unpublished but not entirely some have sold some short stories and there's a fellow I'm talking to who's got a new book out, a children's picture book. Um, so it can be any. And, you know, if somebody could be multiply published and still want to have somebody get some fresh eyes on something. I, I could. I haven't taken advantage of the one here in Regina, but there was a time when I was a little further back in the publishing um, mine that I would have for sure. I never had something like that growing up in Weyburn. I think once there was... A, one writer came in, I think, for a few days as a writer in residence that I was able to talk to. And so I really enjoy being able to give back uh, to people who are interested in writing because it's, it can be a very lonely profession. And this way you have somebody you can talk to about all those things you want to talk to about writing, which you can't necessarily talk to to people who aren't trying to do it. The last time I spoke to a writer in residence was Gail Bowen. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I brought her some coffee and I said, hey, let's just catch up because she had taught me in university oh, in really? one of the writing classes. Oh, cool. I, I really valued her input, so I was curious to see what your experience had been compared to hers. It's been great. I, I learned a lot, too. I mean, one of the reasons that, well, there's a couple of reasons writers like to do, be a writer in residence. One is that it pays, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a freelancer, so, you know, anything for a buck. You need something written? Call me. Um, <laughs> but the other thing is that it's an opportunity to look at when you're looking at other people's writing and trying to make it better, you are learning how to make your own writing better as well. So as I go through other people's manuscripts and identify problems, every once in a while it's something, you know, I've done that too, and now that I see it in somebody else's writing, I'm going to watch out for that the next time I write something. So it's, it's just immersing yourself in that world. Uh, that's, that's great. I was making my way through World Shaper, and it's funny you bring that up because I was feeling that too. Um, I noticed you were switching between first person and third person, and I, I run away from first person because it's really <laughs> hard for me to live in a person's head when I'm trying to write them, especially a female voice. Uh, I just I can't capture it, so I just stay away from it. it I like, cheat. Well, one of the fun <laughs> things about World Shapers, and that, this is very unusual, I very rarely write in first person. And I don't think I've ever done one where I switched from first person to third person. There's actually two third person viewpoints, and then the main viewpoint character is in first person. Um, 
but I'm enjoying it mainly because it, uh, the first person, even though it's a female voice, um, has the same sense of humor as I do. It's very strange. <laughs> and World Shaper is full of my sense of humor and jokes and pop culture references, especially. Well, maybe I should back it up a bit. Elevator pitch, World Shapers to the uninitiated. Okay, well, World Shaper takes place in a labyrinth of shaped worlds, and the people who shaped those worlds live inside them. So in World Shaper, Shauna Keys, my main character, discovers much to her surprise that the world she lives in, which seems similar to ours but has a few significant differences, is not the original world, the first world, but that she actually shaped it. And this mysterious stranger shows up and says, um, hey, you have to get out of here now because somebody has attacked it, as Shauna knows all too well, but you may have the power to save all of the shaped worlds from this adversary who's now attacking your world. So we have to get out of here. We have to travel through all these worlds, and you have to gather the knowledge of the making of them and take them to the mysterious Agrair, who's the woman at the center of the labyrinth who put all these shapers into these worlds and gathered them up from our world and threw them into the labyrinth. That's the premise. And the first book takes place in a world very much like ours, and then Master of the World uh, takes them into a world that was shaped by somebody who really loves Jules Verne. <laughs> so it's all um, weird flying machines and submarines and floating islands and very steampunky. And the third one, which you mentioned, The Moonlit World, is, uh, well, the working title for a long time was uh, Werewolves and Vampires and Peasants. Oh, my. <laughs> so it's that kind of world. Uh, one of the things I was noticing was all the Regina references, all the Saskatchewan <laughs> references. The mayor has the last name of Fougere. Oh, you noticed that, did you? Yeah, the, the, uh, <laughs> the little, I don't want to say portmanteau, um, the mashup of words like you call a high phone and Netflix is referenced in there as something, I can't remember now. Stream picks. Stream picks. Was, is that you kind of flexing your inner Terry Pratchett? Was that a, a wink to the reader? Or what is that? Oh, it's definitely a wink to the reader. The names like Fougere and things like that are definitely. Uh, the other is, though, that those were just ways to show that early on, before you knew what was going on, that this isn't quite our world. It seems like our world. Like the big professional sport is lacrosse. And kite fighting is really big on college campuses. And there's moon colonies yeah. and things like that. And peace. Peace has reigned for 10 years, pretty much, on the planet. So, uh, oh, yeah, and the, the uh, president is a woman who lives in the Emerald Palace, not in the White House. So, uh, those are just little ways to indicate in the early going. Part of the fun of reading science fiction fantasy is trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, especially in science fiction, it's what's, what's different. Why, why, why is this world different? What has changed? And so that's all part of that and just a way to show uh, you're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> One of the things I was struck by as I was reading was it felt a little bit like the gunslinger from uh, Stephen King's Dark Tower oh, yeah, when you yeah. kept describing him. Or maybe uh, I, the multiverse is in everything it seems like these days, but it really kind of felt like uh, Pullman with his uh, Dark Materials. Like you're, It felt like you were referencing in kind of tongue-in-cheek, wink-wink, Maybe you've read this and you have that frame well, of reference. Yeah, some of that is because I have all those references in my head. And my character, she left the real world 10 years ago when she took over this world that she forgets shaping. I'm trying to be careful so that any pop culture references she makes are current up to 10 years ago. And I, don't, I try not to reference anything that's less than 10 years old. I don't know how successful I've been. I've tried. <laughs> um, but when it comes to the multiverse, that's been around... And it's, this is not really the multiverse. This is something a little different. Uh, these are like little pocket universes that have been shaped just With by the twist. people within them. Yeah, so it's, it's a little different setup. But yeah, the idea of being able to travel to different worlds is something that's been done by a lot of authors in, in a lot of different ways. Going back, well, I don't know how far it goes back, but you know, one of the most famous is uh, the Star Trek episode with the mirror universe with Spock with a beard. You know, <laughs> That was an early example in pop uh, uh, and movies anyway, and television, I mean. One of the things I also noticed your characters do is they drink craft beer. <laughs> they do. <laughs> I was like, oh, I wonder if they're going to be drinking schmamelian, you know? <laughs> the, uh, the short story I'm working on was this very day as we're recording this. Um, I reference they're sitting in a bar on some planet and they're drinking something called Old Feathers Stout, which is described as black as space itself. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into today's beer. I already have. It's quite nice. <laughs> This one is called Chinook Crush. It's 4.7%, and it's the first in our brand new series of single hop hazy pale ales. It's designed to be a little more summery and should have flavors and aromas of citrus and grapefruit, and we want it to be bright and refreshing. A complete 
counterpoint to this really, really cold day. Well, as you know, when I took my first sip, I said, this tastes like a summer beer. So I think you've nailed it. <clears throat> I, uh, I enjoy this kind of thing. I don't, and again, you think of drinking it in the summertime, but you know, it's like you think of drinking champagne at special events, but you could drink champagne anyway, anytime. <laughs> so <laughs> you could certainly drink this anytime and enjoy it very much. When I put my nose into it, I, w- I was really impressed by how they were able to pull out those aromas. Um, the Chinook hop, I guess when you when you boil it versus dry hopping, two different sets of uh, treating the hops, two different ways of treating the hops, you get different flavors and aromas. If you put it in the boil, you're going to get more of a piney character, a resinous character, maybe dank. But when you do a wet, uh, not a wet hop, a dry hop, like we did with this in our hop back, you get more grapefruit and citrus. So it's to me the science behind it is interesting to see to see those differences in flavors. Yeah, I used to write a science column. I don't think I ever actually did one on beer per se. I should have though. <laughs> I did one on wine, but I don't think I ever did beer. One of my earliest memories of you is actually reading your tech columns in the Leader Post when I was a kid. Yeah, as a kid. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Yes, uh, I started writing a science column while I was still a communications officer at the Saskatchewan Science Center when it was brand new. And when I left and became a freelancer in 93, I think, is when I left the Science Center, I brought that with me. And it was the science of everyday things. Yeah. And it used to be on CBC Radio with Colin Greer. I was on CBC Radio for 17 years doing a science column. And maybe we did do beer, but I I don't think so. I I could look it up on my website because pretty much all of my old columns are on my website. I don't know why it sticks in my memory, but I remember one where you're talking about quirks of the Windows, uh, just the operating system. Well, that's how to navigate it. And that sounds more like the TV show I hosted with Access Communications uh, um, called Net Talk. That went on for about ten years as well. I was about to mention that next (laughs) because I used to watch you on Net Talk (laughs) on cable access. That's awesome. That's been a while, too. I remember, it's been long enough that I remember how excited we were when somebody brought in a USB um, memory stick, and it had like two megs of memory on it. We were like, wow. <laughs> or maybe it was five. I don't know, but we were way more impressed than you would be now. <laughs> what are we up to now for sticks? Like I have terabytes? Like two terabytes at least, and probably more, yeah. I know I, I have would, a... Well, I don't know. I haven't bought one for a while and they're so cheap that you know i have so many lying around who needs another one but i know i bought a platter drive like the old sata drive for three terabytes and at the time it was like 80 bucks and now you could buy it for like 15 20 dollars yeah i don't know if the usbs have gotten to how many terabytes you could get on one but certainly lots and lots of gigabytes (laughs) one of the other neat things about this beer i know a little sideways there chinook the hop it was actually developed in the yakima valley region and released in 1985 but as they've been iterating and as it's been spreading out into popular kind of beer culture people have been experimenting it with it and developing it and only recently it seems like it's it's taken off in a bigger way well, I, it seems to me like I, you know, I've seen it on beer menus here and there, Chinook this or Chinook that. I did not know it referred to the hop, but that's probably where that name is coming from whenever I see it in a beer. So good to know. I've learned something today. <laughs> Next time you make a beer reference, you, you just call us up and we'll be your subject matter experts. There you, go. <laughs> <laughs> you can throw some uh, hop knowledge at your readers. <laughs> as I tried to think if I had any, any beer in the current book, I don't, I don't think so but as i mentioned it's in that short story i'm writing today so <laughs> what do you usually drink um i like darker beers for the most part um so you know reds red ales sometimes a stout guinness is always i'm always fine with a guinness or anything similar to that especially in the winter time um i don't like extremely hoppy beers my brother uh likes them the hoppier the better and he buys these things that i just don't like at all so it's always a disappointment when i go to his fridge when i visit him in Kelowna. <laughs> well i would say this is this is maybe a session version not quite an ipa yeah it, it doesn't strike me as t- too hoppy it's it's i like the flavor a lot and yet it has that little bit of crispness that you you get from that tons and tons of hops are in there but 
the way we treated it and the way the hazy yeast is and with the dry hopping, it's it's not that acrid, bitter punch in the Yeah, mouth. I think that's what I react to in the really hopped up beers. Well, at the end of the day, if you're a big stout guy, we'll send you home with some oatmeal stout. It's my favorite beer. Oh, I, that sounds good. It's perfect for this <laughs> kind of weather. <laughs> so, <laughs> what's next for Ed Willett? I mean, you got sounds like you got so many projects on the go. Well, the Moonlit World is currently... <laughs> currently in revisions it's already due and it's not finished yet but it's getting there i'll be submitting it um by the end of january and it'll be out this fall um i have a young adult novel called uh, a star song which is something that i wrote a long time ago but i'm rewriting it and i'm going to bring it out under my own little publishing company shadowpaw press i hope to have a kickstarter launching soon where i will be featuring short stories written by the authors I've interviewed in the first year of the World Shapers podcast and I also hope to get volume one of a nonfiction series gathering some of the writing advice that I've gleaned doing those interviews and I hope to put that into book form uh, so there's a few things <laughs> when I saw you uh, doing the podcast thing is World Shapers now a departure from your books and now you're talking to authors who are in their own sense shapers and builders is that yeah that's the doing? idea i mean i've always been interested in talking to other authors about their creative process and when world shapers the series launched it seemed like an opportune time to bring my other you know the radio i was started as a newspaper reporter i've done tons of interviews with tons of people bring that into my field and start talking to other authors and because I have connections in the field, after all the years I've been in it, I've seen people at conventions, and you know, I, I can get hold of people. I just started asking people, and I've had an amazing uh, selection of guests, um, international bestsellers, many of them, way, way more popular than I am. <laughs> I noticed some big names in there. You even had John Scalzi. John Scalzi was one of my first ones. Yeah, we we've known each other. Uh, Toronto hosted the World Science Fiction Convention in 2004. That was the first one John Scalzi attended, and the very first panel at a science fiction convention he was ever on was a panel I was on. So we met literally at the start of his career. He didn't have his novel, wasn't, his first novel wasn't even out yet. Um, I mean, he'd been writing, but so yeah, and he was happy to, to do it when I, I called him up. So John Scalzi, Robert J. Sawyer, Tanya Huff, yeah. David Brin, Tad Williams... Uh, well, Scalzi, he's like a he's like us. He's a former journalist, you know, ink stained wretch, you know that whole yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I liked when you had the discussion with him about fractal editing, because you were getting really into the meat and potatoes of how you edit drafts, and I really liked what he said because everything anyone else has told me about their editing process, I was like, ah, that doesn't apply to me. But then when you talk to John and he's like, I do this, and I'm like, oh. I well, that's it. one of the things, and this has been great being writer in residence in Saskatoon, is that I can say there's no one way to do this. Everybody has their own way of doing it. Um, my style is you write from start to finish, and then you go back and rewrite from start to finish. I always write the thing from start at the beginning, right to the end. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote correcting as he went along, editing as he went along. Uh, some people write massive outlines. Peter V. Brett, who's another best-selling author, writes 150 page outlines before he writes any actual fiction and he just kind of fleshes it out other people say well i have an idea and i start writing and when i get to the end i go back and shape it you know so one of the great things about the podcast for anybody who's interested in writing is listening to the fact that there are a million different ways to write stories and yet all these people have had success they're all multi usually multiply published authors um, so the way you're doing it all you have to do is find a way to make it work for you there's no one right way to do it do you ever find yourself when you're looking at the page you're you've got a tons of text and you're just going blind and you're just like i can't see this anymore i can't figure this out yeah i mean if you're after you've worked on something for a long time so you write the you write it taking a break is very helpful and that's what i'm doing right now with the moonlit world i've taken too long a break because of christmas so i'm behind now but i'll get onto it um when you go back, you get a, a fresher perspective on it. And that's also the advantage of having somebody like a writer in residence or a, what they're often called beta readers who are people who read your stuff before, they, before you finish it off. It's getting that second set of eyes on things and they see things that you don't because you're too close to the material. One of the things I find as writer in residence is that people will often, they know the material so well that they know exactly what's going on in the scene. 
but they didn't put it all on the page. So the reader comes to it and think, but wait a minute, I thought this guy was somewhere else, and all of a sudden he's in the scene, and you know, I don't understand what's going on. Um, so having that another set of eyes looking at it or just giving yourself time to look at it fresh makes a big difference. One of the themes that, or one of the things I keep coming back to is show, don't tell. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe it's because we live in like a TV screens kind of world, but I feel like it's even more relevant today when I'm writing show, don't tell. Yes, writing has changed. I mean, you go back to the 19th century and <laughs> I love, or, or the 18th century, you go back to, to some of those old books and they'll have paragraphs that are a single sentence that go on, you know, half a page or more. And it's basically one sentence with a lot of semicolons and asides. And I actually love writing like that and I do it every once in a while. Um, but things have changed and the pace of writing, I think, especially in the genre writing, science fiction and fantasy, people are looking for a more rapid paced. Some people are looking for a more rapid paced. I hate to be general because <laughs> everybody's an individual, but certainly I think that the writing style has changed so there's more of that fast paced action, uh, vivid imagery kind of thing. I kind of cheat. I, when I'm plotting on a thing, I'll, I'll go, what's gonna grab them by the lapels? And shake them and smack them in the face. And then they, then I let them catch their breath, and then I get into the story. I think one of the people I talked to was uh, Larry Correa, who has a series called Monster Hunter Nation. And uh, I decided to read his book a long time ago, kind of on a whim, because I'd heard something about it. And it starts with this guy killing his boss, who's a werewolf, and there's this knockdown, drag-out fight, and basically a cubicle farm. <laughs> And that really grabbed you, and then after that you just had to keep reading to see what, what the heck is going on here. So yeah, you can, if you can grab people like that, uh, then you're, once you have their attention, then you can slow down and build the story or build the characterization or whatever you need to do. But grabbing them right up front, because people are going to look at those first few pages and it'll either grab them or it won't. Now this is a, this is a real cop-out. This is a shameless question. You're a storyteller. You're a your former journalist. What's one question no one ever asks you that you, you wish they would? <laughs> I don't know. I've been asked an awful lot of questions. <laughs> well, the, the one I ask everybody <clears throat> that I don't always get asked is, or often get asked myself is, why? <laughs> why do you write? <laughs> Specifically, why do you write this stuff? And I ask every one of my guests on the World Shapers that question, and you get a lot of interesting answers, but it kind of boils down to what I've always felt, which is, well, the one you often get is that because if I wasn't, the voices in my head would drive me crazy. I don't actually feel that. But the fact that human beings are storytelling, story is what defines human society and human culture. And, uh, you know, you go back to to the, the, the cavemen who are telling stories about their latest hunting escapades and they were putting pictures on the walls and things like that. It's clearly a part of us. And I think the being able to tell stories is a way of making connection with other people, sort of getting outside of the head that we're all trapped in, our own head, and somehow getting into somebody else's head in some fashion. Uh, and so I think that's why I write. I just want to Ultimately, I want to entertain. I'm an entertainer, but it's that, that reaching out to other people and saying, isn't this great? Look at this thing I thought of. Now you can think it too. <laughs> it's kind of like telepathy. One of, the, one of the pieces I was reflecting on lately is how podcasting is kind of becoming the new long form way of sharing ideas. We're, we're in this rapid fire world of instant gratification. You know, I got that like, I got that feedback, that dopamine in my brain went, okay, there you go. You get some. You can feel good for a moment. So it's much harder to get a reward for putting in all the hard work for the, the reading of a thing. But if you're like cleaning the toilet and you can plug in a podcast in your head and just have those voices there, they can be with you without that extra bit of effort. I think it's the growth of audiobooks as well. There's something that, you know, you spend all that time commuting or driving or whatever. Not so much commuting around here, but, you know, in some cities you might be on a train for an hour and a half before you get to work. Um, and it's a way to, you can, can still experience that connection. Um, I, think that, I think that's one reason audiobooks is growing as well. 
it's insane the the rate of explosion there i have friends who do voice work and they read books and record their voice and then sell that to a publisher they they are on contract now to read somebody else's book yeah, I've done some of that myself, uh, recording both my own and I've recorded for some other people. And I'd love to do more, but it's ex- <laughs> it's enormously time-consuming. <laughs> I don't know that anyone would ever want to listen to my voice for that long. <laughs> Certainly not my wife. She, she, I'd wake up with a knife in my chest. Technically, I have, I have a number of my own books that I have the rights to that I want to record. So that's something else that maybe this year I'll finally get around to. I, I hope so. <laughs> So where can people find you if they want to look for you online? The uh, best place is my main website, which is edwardwillett.com. That's W-I-L-L-E-T-T.com. Don't drop that second T off Willett. That's what happens all the time. Um, I'm on Twitter at E. Willett. I'm on Facebook at edward.willett. Uh, you can find the, the podcast at theworldshapers.com. And it's on Twitter at theworldshapers. Thank you for your time. Well, thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks for the beer. (laughs) (laughs) Cheers. Cheers. Rebels, thanks for listening today. I'm going to include all those links in the show notes so you can find the World Shapers podcast and all of Ed's social media content and web channel with one click. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, be sure to join us on our Facebook group page at Rebellion Brewing Podcast. You just go on Facebook and look up Rebellion Brewing Podcast. It'll pop up. New episodes and new beers are coming out all the time, so be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped. Untapped is like Facebook for beer. You'll be able to keep your finger on the pulse and find out what's coming out in the new hot trends for 2020. Personally, I'm predicting more IPAs, more hazy, and more sour. Thank you for joining the Rebellion.